just a reminder while he's getting that set up that if you do want to watch the YouTube uh, live stream in another link, make sure you just have it muted so it doesn't bounce back and forth on you. <laughs> I'll mute myself right now on this one. I think we are set. We are live. Okay. Am I showing up in the speaker's screen? Because I still have Shanti on mine. Are we ready? Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the University of Saskatchewan Engineering 3MT competition. We are thrilled to have 24 participants today, and we this is the second year we've done this in engineering. Last year, we had a fabulous morning. We've got a panel of judges, some of whom are returning and some of whom are brand new. And I know that they will have a lot of insightful comments for you. I wanted to say a little bit about the importance of sharing our ideas and getting this kind of practice because it helps us when we do job interviews. It helps us when we're trying to sell our ideas and pick things. It is really, really a great idea because it helps us to get out of the details of our research and elevate them and talk about them in ways that everybody can understand. So this is a very informal event. This is something where we're working with each other and working with our colleagues to get better and to grow and to learn. It's a wonderful way to get to know other people in the college and get a little bit of a flavor of the incredible variety of work that's being done. And I want to thank the speakers who are putting themselves out there and taking on that challenge of getting better and teaching each other because it provides a lot of energy for your own degree, for the people around you, and it helps to make other people more courageous and helps them to get braver. So maybe they'll do a presentation next year. So thank you, Shahab, for inviting me to come and welcome people today. It's always a pleasure to be with students and to share a little bit of your lives. I'm going to be staying for the first few presentations as long as I can. And I just want to finish off by wishing everybody good luck and have a fabulous, fabulous morning. Thank you, Dean Cresta. Um, now I'd like to open up to the judges just to introduce yourselves one by one, um, say where you're from, and a bit of encouragement to all the presenters today. Okay, I will start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sumit Kahande, project manager with SAS Water. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, exciting event, and this is my second year as a judge. And I want to thank uh, Engineering Graduate Community Council for inviting me as a judge. This is a great opportunity for me to learn engineering research work in the future. Uh, thank you so much for inviting. And also, I want to thank uh, grad students who are participating in the competition this morning. And uh, uh, for me, the participation is the really important thing, as uh, Professor Susan said, and uh, you will be uh, learning a lot of things and you will get confidence uh, by doing this one. And, um, you know, in my eye, uh, all of you are winners just by participating and sharing your research work, uh, you know, in front of this audience. And uh, I look forward to the presentation and good luck. Thank you. I'll go next then. Uh, welcome everyone, all the participants in the competition. I wish you best luck. Uh, my name is Zuzsa Pap. I'm the business development uh, director for MyTex. And uh, I have uh, judged before. Um, last year was amazing, so I'm looking forward to learning from you. Uh, I'll go then next. Uh, Bert Monroe, I'm a retired civil engineer with uh, about 40 years experience, uh, past vice president with Associated Engineering and 
past president of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists here in Saskatchewan. Um, also a trustee with the Engineering Advancement Trust. You'll see the footprints all over the college. Uh, very excited to be here as part of this uh, competition judging panel and, and to see a glimpse into the future that uh, you all bring to us. So best of luck to all of the competitors and thank you very much for allowing me to be here. I'll go next. Uh, this is Mohsen Shakuri. Uh, I did my chemical engineering bachelor's back home in Iran, University of Universal Technology, Tehran, Iran. And I got my master's and PhD both from chemical engineering here, University of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. And I'm currently working as a scientist and beam line responsible at soft X ray remarker characterization beam line at Canadian Light Source. I'm really happy to be here. And I hope that this is going to excite people to attend even more next year. Looking forward to it. I can go next. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tate Sao. Uh, I'm an assistant professor, faculty member at College of Engineering, uh, the School of Professional Development. My focus is on entrepreneurship and the commercialization of technology. Uh, I recognize uh, many of the names from uh, last year's uh, entrepreneurship workshop from the classes. So hello, everyone. Uh, good luck to all of you. Uh, I definitely applaud you to uh, step out here, uh, put your research and uh, your presentation skill uh, to test. I think uh, this is really important uh, to, to really understand deeper the impact of your research and the potential uh, world you can Build with your technology uh, to to make the world a better place. So I'm very excited to see uh, all of your presentations. Uh, good luck again. Thank you, judges. Um, now we'll have the president of the EGCC uh, give a quick welcome message. Thank you, Shanti. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see all to see you all here in the second engineering three minute thesis competition. And uh, I want to appreciate the support and kindness of our judges that uh, they take, uh, they give us their time uh, and uh, to judge our graduate students' communication skills. And I'm going to also appreciate the graduate students who kind of uh, participated and uh, tried and take a step to improve their communication skills and to, uh, take another step to their future career. So good luck, everyone, and hope we have a fun time all together. Awesome. Thanks, Shahab. Uh, so welcome to the engineering three minute thesis competition at the University of Saskatchewan. We want to acknowledge that we, the university is on Treaty 6, uh, home of the Métis, and even though we're all everywhere, um, I'm sure we can appreciate that greatly. Um, my name is Shanti Bergen, and I have the opportunity of being your MC for this event today. Uh, this three-minute thesis competition allows everyone in the audience and other presenters to get really excited about what is happening at the University of Saskatchewan. And I, for one, am looking forward to all the presentations. I had the opportunity to win uh, the University of Saskatchewan 3MT competition last year. And so I can't participate again this year. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to see what's all happening and really looking forward to it. Uh, a few housekeeping things uh, for the presenters as well as the audience. I'll be presenting the slide. They get one single stagnant slide. Um, on the bottom right hand corner, there's going to be a countdown timer or a count up timer, I guess is what will happen. Presenters, you don't have to do anything with that. As soon as you start talking, I'll start the timer. Um, and once it's at three minutes, that'll be the end of your time. Uh, presenters as well, please log on to the WebEx Live about two presentations prior uh, to your presentation, uh, just so we make sure things keep running smoothly. Um, also, mute all microphones, judges and presenters when you're not speaking, uh, just to make sure we don't have any background noise there. Uh, there will be a survey monkey at the very end of 25 presentations, and that will allow everyone in the audience as well as presenters um, to vote for their people's choice uh, category, and as well as when you do um, do the voting, you also be entered into a door prize. So that's super exciting. Um, yeah, as far as that goes, um, any of the presenters, please feel free to chat with Shahab uh, throughout if you have any questions as well as the judges. And without further ado, here we go. Uh, so our first presenter is Anu Anu Aluhu, and he's going to be presenting 
on the ultrasonic and fungal pretreatment of switchgrass for biofuel and bioproduct applications. Um, so I'll just get it on the screen here, one sec. First one's gonna give us a little technical difficulty. One sec here. All right, that should be good. And then Shahab, if you can allow him in there. He's here. All right, whenever you're ready. No. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Um, I think he might be having some technical difficulties. Ono, can you start your presentation or can you not hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, but my video is uh, kind of freezing. Okay, well, how about um, we'll head to Emmanuel's presentation and we'll come back to you. We'll see if we can get your video going. How's that sound? That's okay. All right. So, Emmanuel, if you're ready to go. Yep, looks like you are there. Uh, you'll be yes. presenting on the comparative study of stabilized AFC and hybrid organic and inorganic halide uh, photoconductors for monographic <laughs> applications. We'll get on the screen there. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hi, I'm ready. All right. Hi, everyone. A breast cancer is one of the most common cancer found in women, Canada, globally. And last in year 2020, Canadian Cancer Society reported that 25% of the reported cases of breast cancer and uh, among those people that are reported there from cancer, 13% have from breast cancer. So these statistics are quite high. So this is, and the good thing is, early detection has also proven to give the patient more than 95% chance of survival. So this is where my project comes into play. If you take a look at the picture on the screen, you will see four different types of mammographic images from A to D, which shows different density in the breast tissue. The main focus here actually is the one on the right side, the D. It shows an extremely dense breast tissue, which is very hard to detect if it has cancer, cancerous cell. It is also said that detecting cancerous cell in this, in this tissue is like finding a snowball in a blizzard. So there is a need for the next generation of X-ray detectors that are capable of detecting the cancerous cell in this situation. So this is where my research comes in. So working on developing uh, um, uh, perovskite-based X-ray detectors, which are believed to have better X-ray sensitivity and low dark current. What I'm doing currently is to perform electrical measurement and characterize these devices to be able to compare them to the already commercialized amorphous selenium. What this would give each cancer, uh, breast cancer patient is affordability in terms of treatment and better diagnosis. So I believe that uh, my PhD thesis will contribute to the development of more sensitive X-ray detectors that will enable better diagnosis for breast cancer. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, next, we'll go to Nazani, 
and they will be presenting on developing air sanitizing units for inactivation of pathogens. Example, COVID-19, we're all very aware of. Um, I'll get your slide up here. And whenever you're ready, I'll start the counter. Hello, I'm ready. Okay, hi. On September, like millions of parents all around the world, I faced with a big question, to school or not to school during the pandemic? If you have been a parent of kids going to a school, back to a school plague of flow should be a familiar story to you. So I was thinking that the road ahead for this year is going to be pretty bumpy with combination of COVID-19 and annual back to school plague of flu. But surprisingly, it has been our best school year with no flu so far, thanks to this pandemic and wearing masks. A school's poor indoor air quality is not new, just it was not taken seriously. But now, because of this pandemic, indoor air quality and airborne transmission is being taken more seriously. Buildings are home to many sources of air contaminations, including bacteria, viruses, and mold. 14 million school days per year are missed in the United States due to the asthma and allergies made worse by the poor indoor air quality of schools. My research has focused on developing air sanitizing units for inactivation of pathogens such as COVID-19 in the air. Most recent technologies are based on sending oxidizers to the indoor air and attacking pathogens and other pollutants in the air. But this process is very slow and these oxidizers are not smart and just attack everything in the air. So they may create more mess in the air by, pro by producing some harmful byproducts. Our solution is to add catalyst to this process. Catalyst is a magical powder and superhero of our technology by producing stronger oxidizers from the same oxidizers and accelerating the reaction. And also like any other superhero, it has an excellent leadership capability. It leads these stronger oxidizers to react with, contaminated, with contaminations in the air to a secure way with no harmful byproducts. As a chemical engineer, my job is to design and synthesize the cost effective and efficient catalyst and to optimize the process in a way that this catalyst can do its best with low energy consumption and carbon footprint. In our lab, we have demonstrated the, effect the effectiveness of this process in removing organic pollutants from the air. Now on the main phase, we are working to apply this technology to destroy the surface functional groups of pathogens. Many things can affect our child's health and future from the foods that they eat, to the friends that they make, and to the air that they breathe. Let's keep breathe safe. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Next, we'll have Edgar, and he'll be showing us his work on canola dehulling. Edgar, are you ready there? I see you on the group. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well? I can hear you. Um, yeah, I got you there. Yeah, go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Shandy, Shandy uh, just a suggestion before you start. Uh, after each presentation, can you give us a couple of seconds so that we can finish creating marking? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So do you want me to start now or do you want more time? I don't know. We'll give them a few minutes just to uh, catch up a little bit there, and then I'll let you know uh, when we're about to start for you. So just give Sounds us one sec. Good. Yeah, if you give us like 30 seconds after each one, my opinion, that would be great. So then, it's, then we have equal time after each one. That would work. Absolutely, that'll be our plan. Alrighty, Edgar, if you're ready, you can go ahead and I'll start the timer. Okay, thanks. 
Hello everyone. I guess most of you have some canola oil sitting in your kitchen. How do I know this? Well, I am not a mentalist, but a researcher who works with canola seed. And I know that oil is the main product that we can obtain from canola. However, at the end of my presentation today, you will realize that canola has more much to offer for us, not only oil. At the top of my slide, you can see a picture of canola in which you can identify in brown the hole or the external coat of the seed and in yellow the embryo. Moreover, you can see that canola has a high protein content that range from 27 to 30%. This value is very similar to that or slightly lower than that of soybeans. This implies that we could produce animal feed and human food using canola protein. Unfortunately, canola also has a high fiber content that is concentrated mainly in that external coat on the shell or hole that limits its uses in the food industry. So is that all? Well, no. Actually, my research project is focused on finding more efficient methods to aid the removal of the hole in order to produce meals with higher protein content. In fact, we have discovered a method that can disconnect that hole from the embryo, creating an air gap between those two uh, surfaces. This new process consists of adding water to the seed and drying it very fast with a fluidized bed dryer, which simply blows hot air. After this process, we have observed the formation of an air gap, like the one that you can see on the right bottom corner of my uh, slide. Although this gap in the figure is very small, it allows for the hole to break more easily. And at the same time, that gap protects the embryo from any damage that can occur during the process. These images were analyzed using a non-destructive um, imaging technique called tomography or CT scan. In conclusion, my research will allow us to rescue food that is currently being waste in the production of oil canola. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Edgar. We'll give the judges now about 30 seconds and Thanks. then we'll come back with Salma's presentation. So Salma, can you get your camera ready? Um, I'll let you know when we're about to start. Hi, Shanti. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and see you. We're just going to give the judges a few moments here and I'll let you know when we're ready to start. Okay. Just, just let the presenters know that in the bottom corners, you could see those circles. They're kind of indicating the time that you have. So when 20 starts, it shows one, which means you're in the first minute. Then it shows two, you're in the second minute. And then three, that you're in the third minute. And when it shows done, you have you are out of time. So uh, you mean the, uh, the, the circles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That there are the... Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Salma, if you're ready to go ahead with your presentation on discrepancies in Cope and Geyer climate classification maps in observation, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Hello, everyone. I'm pretty sure that the following questions came to your mind at least one time, that what is weather? What is climate? How these two are related to each other? The, uh, the climate is the general patterns of weather over a long period of time, but how can we measure and quantify a climate? Uh, the primary classification of Earth's cli climate is known as Köppen-Geiger system. It divides the climate into five major groups of tropical, dry, mild temperate, snow, and polar. Each of these major groups are divided into subtypes, which gives us more detailed information about the all possible types of climate types. It also informs us that if the 
precipitation and temperature changes, how uh, we can, uh, how would be the climate type? Uh, for, for example, if the precipitation and temperature increases, we would face the tropical climate type. But the question here would be that, um, as the, this, uh, these classifications evaluate the climate type by taking into account of precipitation and temperature patterns, how would the evaluation of climate type by using this classification vary if different data sources of precipitation and temperature has been used. In my research, I used near two dozen different sets of data sources that provides the temperature and precipitation data to measure the uncertainty in evaluating the climate type on terrestrial region on Earth. Uh, according to my finding, we see that in, uh, in some regions um, on the planet, we have higher uncertainty in evaluating the climate type, which means that then what is the exact climate type of a region if we, if we would get different climate type by using different da uh, data sources of precipitation and temperature. Um, this issue has been uh, resolved in my study by developing a robust climate type, uh, climate type map, which tells us what is the real and exact climate type of each region on Earth. And um, this, um, actually, this result would be valuable and helps the uh, the literature in order to uh, boost the accuracy in uh, measuring the climate change, evaluating the vegetation and ecosystem type that they are special for each type of climate types. And also it helps the, uh, the engineers to improve their design of infrastructures. Thank you for your time. I'm done. Perfect, thank you, Salma. Uh, we'll give the judges a few moments uh, just to collect their thoughts on the presentation and Mohammed. Um, if you can get your mic and camera ready, uh, you'll be up next. Okay. I'm ready. Uh, when should I start? <laughs> All right, Mohammed, you can go ahead with your presentation on real time prediction of cascading failures. Whenever you're ready, um, I'll just start the timer. Okay, um, I'm ready. Uh, hello, everyone. So, usually, we always assume that the electricity is working. We press the light switch and boom we have electricity. That's our assumption. However, sometimes disaster happens, whether it's man-made or due to nature, like what happened in Texas uh, just recently, and you end up with a whole province or a whole state or sometimes a whole country without electricity. Now, how do they usually deal with it in the electrical grids? Well, the, the way you, they usually deal with it is that how can we prevent it from ever happening? So you add more generators, more transmission lines. Uh, you try to eliminate the probability of it happening. However, my research is tackling it in a different way. What if we assume that it will actually happen, which is always the case, and Texas just proved it, and instead we try to limit the impact. So instead of having a whole... Uh, province without an electricity, maybe just a city or two. And that's where my work comes into play. I'm trying to predict cascading failure, which is the event that happens before a blackout, which is just a successive uh, failures that end in a blackout. And then after detecting it, we will try to isolate the areas where it's, uh, the areas that have the most severe impact and we will lose them eventually, obviously, but we still have the rest of the network. So uh, as the diagram showing, instead of you, your friend, and your uncle, all of you not having electricity, you still have an electricity. Uh, your friend is out of luck. However, your uncle doesn't have electricity at his house, but he can still go to the hospital at a nearby city. So um, although my algorithm doesn't do magic, um, like the real-time prediction of cascading failure, uh, but obviously it's much better 
than the original case, which is the whole province or multiple cities having a blackout. Now, the way I'm doing that is through a recurrent neural network uh, LSTM uh, models, which is just like a, a longer way to say like artificial intelligence. And that's mainly uh, my work. And with that, um, Muhammad, I am Muhammad Mahjoub, and this is my PhD in three minutes and how I can save you from a potential blackout. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, we'll give the judges some time uh, with that presentation. And Carmen, if you can get your camera and mic ready, I'll let you know when we're good to go. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, I just can't see you yet. Can you get your camera on? Yeah, I try to add it, but uh, I think I have to log out and come back in. I don't know what's going on. Can you get your camera on? Shanti, I think Onu is also waiting here. Maybe you could give. Okay, he's here. Yeah, we can see you now. I uh, just can't hear you very well. Yeah, no, I'll I'll have your slide. Um, we're just waiting for the judges to be ready for your presentation. Is there a way you can get louder? Um, I can barely hear you. Um, I still can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, uh, how about now? That's much better. We can okay. work with that. Yes. All right. So give the judges just a second here. Uh, then we're ready to go with your presentation. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, hello, all of us here are using the internet for sending and receiving information from smartphones, desktop computers, and also tablets. This is, it is tough to be far from the internet for only several days. Even some people cannot tolerate not using the internet for several hours. Just imagine we cannot check our Facebook or Instagram account only for one day. We would feel disconnected from our friends. Uh, I know some people are not active on some social medias, but how about the other applications and services that the internet has been provided for us? Is it possible not to use the internet in our daily life? Just think about how the internet helps our uh, life to be easier. Here I come with an essential question that I'm sure just a few people consider it. How many of us uh, think about confidentiality and uh, privacy through the internet. Every day we transmit our data uh, through the internet. This data could be uh, a very typical question uh, or some private photos and also chat with a friend. The great part is that uh, we are using most of the applications and services as free, totally free. Uh, but uh, the scariest part and other point is that, unfortunately, our data is analyzed by the provided company. They are monitoring us to gain our emotions, our habits, our daily lives. Uh, and then uh, they provide some advertisement based on that. I'm sure all of us here have been faced uh, on Google and Facebook advertisement by a simple search through the Google or on Facebook. Uh, I would say that when uh, we don't pay for product, we are the product. Uh, we are the product for Google, Facebook, and other applications. Uh, I know we are using some username and password to protect our information, but unfortunately, the application owner knows everything about our lives. My research focuses on solving this critical issue. I'm working on a modern way of cryptography to keep privacy completely that is called homomorphic encryption. 
In this method of cryptography, we encrypt the data and send it uh, to these kind of application. After analyzing our data by the application server, the data uh, will be sent back to us. And by decrypting the data, we will see our uh, new data. The fascinating thing is that the owner of application will not know anything about our data. This method uh, keeps our information and data completely confidential. Uh, thanks for your watching. That was uh, my three, you know, my three minutes thesis presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Carmen. That was that was great. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to Khaled next. Uh, we're just going to give the judges some time, um, and I'll let you know when you're ready to go with your presentation. All right, Khaled, I got your slide up there. Um, your presentation is on eco-friendly sorbent for treatment of aqueous arsenic. Uh, whenever you're ready, uh, just turn on your mic and go ahead and I'll start the timer. Okay, uh, I can start now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about water, the essence of life. Needless to say, water brings life to our planet and us. But how is the quality of water available for us? Does everyone have access to clean water? We know bacteria can make the drinking water unsafe, and yes, it is the most important pollutant in water. However, over 2 million people in more than 70 countries, including Canada, yes, you heard it right, including Canada, are in danger of second water poisoning element arsenic. Arsenic is the king of poison. It is also known as the poison of kings. Why? Because it was used to kill kings in the ancient time. But nowadays, arsenic is a worldwide health and environmental problem because it is toxic and can lead to cancer. Now we know what is the problem, but could, how, how we can solve this problem? During years, different methods were developed to uh, treatment of arsenic, but they are usually expensive. Here in University of Saskatchewan, we are working on a more accessible method, which also can benefit our local economy. As you know, Saskatchewan is uh, known for its uh, long winters, which does not have much, much to do with our research, but it is also good at agriculture. So we want to benefit from this opportunity and give back to our community, but how? One of the methods that can be used for arsenic treatment is adsorption. Adsorption is like fishing. In this process, a contaminate like arsenic can attach to a solid surface and can be removed from water. Uh, now, are we going to use agricultural products to arsenic treatment? Well, the answer is yes and no. Usually, when we talk about uh, agricultural products like apple, you can see in the uh, slide, everyone thinks about apple flesh as the product and skin as the waste. But we don't see agricultural waste as a real waste. They can be more useful. But how? Uh, we have developed a new electrochemical method to make agricultural waste as arsenic absorbent. This method is easy to use, time effective and cheap, that can improve the arsenic absorption capacity of agricultural wastes like uh, wheat and canola straw or other uh, cereal straws or husk more than 30 times by deposition of iron oxide on their surface that uh, these iron oxides can act as like, uh, like glue 
to uptake arsenic from water. Also, this method can create a new income avenue for farmers in Canada and Saskatchewan by using agricultural waste. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Shima will do your presentation next. I'm just going to give the judges some time uh, and I'll come back and let you know when you're ready to go with yours. Doesn't look like Shima has joined us yet. Uh, so, Teddy, would you be ready to go next? Uh, if you can turn on your mic and your video and let me know, that'd be great. Uh, okay, um, I'm ready to go. You're ready? All right, um, just turn on your mic there and I'll get your slide up here. Uh, can you hear me? Doesn't look like Shima has joined us yet. Uh, so, Teddy, would you be ready to go next? Um, you can turn on your mic and your video and you can Oh, and make sure, Teddy, to mute your YouTube stream, please. Um, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're ready to go. You're ready? All right. Um, Just turn on. Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, You need to turn on your camera, though. Yeah. I'm just getting. Perfect. That looks great. All right, whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. Okay, so if I ask the audience, how many have lived in or been to basement apartments? A number of you will have your hands up. And the first thing you notice about basements is this musty odor or smell of dampness. And this is because the humidity or moisture content in the air is not properly controlled in those spaces. Living under such conditions not only promotes low productivity and fatigue, but in fact, the World Health Organization affirms that exposure to such conditions may lead to cardiovascular diseases and respiratory disorders. Wow, that sounds quite dreadful. So how then can we control this humidity? Well, we look to simple materials known as desiccants that can remove moisture. They're similar to the silica gel packets that you find in your new shoes or new bags that you buy at the store. These materials boldly say, do not eat, so you don't think it's a free snack in your new coffee maker because they're quite poisonous. Okay, so we know these desiccants can remove moisture, but how can this be applied to buildings? Well, in heating, ventilating, and units, simply called HVAC, these desiccants are coated on the heat exchanger plates inside the unit. So if you look at the picture on the right, let's say we have this cold or humid air from the outdoors, and this air is going into the HVAC unit. The cold air is heated via the heat exchanger, and the humid air is dried via the desiccant. So at the end, you have this nice warm and dry air that is sent through the ceiling vents and distributed through the entire building. In my research, I was able to determine experimentally 
that this desiccants not only have a quick transient response, but they're capable of removing moisture of at least 60% of their entire weight. So now, thereby controlling the humidity to the desired indoor conditions. Wow. So imagine the amount of energy and cost saved by not installing extra equipment, such as dehumidifiers. Also, someone in the audience might be thinking, why should we care about this research at all? So statistics in Canada have shown that people spend at least 90% of their entire lives in buildings, even more so with this global pandemic. So it's important to keep people comfortable in buildings and enable them live long, healthy, and happy lives. Thank you. Great, thank you, Teddy. Uh, next we'll have Fahima. Um, if you can get your camera and mute off there and get ready, we'll let the judges have some time to recap and I'll come back and let you know when we're ready to go. Hi, Shanti, I'm ready. Perfect. Thank you. I see you there. Uh, we'll just give the judges a few moments and I'll let you know when we're ready to start. All right, Fahima, if you're ready to go with your biodiesel production from Green Seed Canola Oil presentation, uh, you can start whenever and I'll start the timer. Yes, I'm ready, I can start. Hi everyone, uh, as you know, energy is a primary need in different sectors of human life and the energy demand is increasing over time due to the population growth. In the transportation sector, fossil fuel is the basic resource of energy. So what are the demerits of using fossil fuels? Using fossil fuels leads to the reduction in crude oil reserves and also has harmful environmental impact. But without fossil fuels, the world will face important deficiencies. So what can we use to replace them? We have to find green sources of energy to be clean, sustainable, and possess environmentally friendly features. Biodiesel is biodegradable and renewable energy, which is a promising alternative to fossil fuels. However, there are two major barriers to biodiesel commercialization worldwide. The first one is the high cost of biodiesel production, and the other one is using edible oil as raw material for biodiesel production, which has been considered a threat to hunger. 88% of the total cost of biodiesel production is attributed to the feedstock. 88% of the total cost. So we can understand that the key factor for tackling the issue is related to the choice of feedstock. With this regard, I have worked on finding the most appropriate feedstock, considering the most crucial factors, including being non-edible, cost is a non-edible low quality oil that is abundantly available in Saskatchewan and Canada. It is unsuitable for human consumption, and treatment of this oil for edible purposes is costly. Therefore, using this oil for biodiesel production, on the one hand, provides a market for this oil uh, that's been faced a lot of challenges for being used in the food industry, and on the other hand, overcomes biodiesel production barriers. In conclusion, canola biodiesel is green energy that helps to preserve the environment. Even the addition of a small amount of canola by diesel significantly decreases emissions. Consequently, it could help provincial and federal government to complement its target 
for decreasing carbon dioxide emissions by 2030. Moreover, canola biodiesel benefits farmers as they can sell their low quality seeds for the generation of high value products. So it also contributes to the agriculture and economy in Canada. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next, Anu, are you able to get your camera and video going? Um, I know we had some issues at the start there. Are you able to turn on your camera and video? We'll jump back to you if you can. Wonderful, I can see you there. We'll just give the judges uh, a bit of time. If you can mute your YouTube, that would be great. Um, and I'll let you know when we're ready to get started. I'll pull up your slide. All right, Ono, if you're hey, ready to go ahead there. Go ahead there. Oh, uh, yeah, you can go yeah, ahead. Can we ever live in a pollution-free and healthy environment? Do you know why I asked this question? For several years of my life, I've heard that biofuel, that is fuel made from plant materials, are environmentally friendly and better than fossil fuel. Just look at the first picture on the slide. You see that these plant materials are everywhere. But the big question is, who amongst us uses 100% bioethanol as fuel in your car? Of course, the answer is none of us. Why? Because bioethanol is very expensive. You take a look at the second picture in that slide. During winter, you wear layers of jackets to protect your body against cold. Similarly, the part of the plant material called lignin protects the cellulose, which is the complex sugar, the key raw material for bioethanol production from enzyme attack. And this pre prevents its use. Currently, several methods have been developed to remove this lignin from the plant material. But these methods are very expensive and they generate harmful substance to the environment. My research seeks to solve this problem by developing an efficient and cheaper way of removing this living by using fungi and ultrasonic waves. Again, how do you want to solve this? During winter, if you find yourself in a warm place, there is this natural tendency to remove your jacket, right? In that same way, Microorganisms such as fungi, when they feed on these plant materials, they generate enzyme that is able to remove this lignin. On the other hand, when you dive into the swimming pool, you notice that it generates ripples. In the same way too, when you introduce sand waves in water, it generates bubbles which results to high pressure and temperature. So when we subject plant materials in such a uh, water solution, it changes its structure. So my research combines these two processes to remove lignin from plant materials so that we can assess complex sugars for bioethanol production. The results of my research will make it possible for us to produce bioethanol at an affordable cost so that you and I cannot just only hear that biofuels are environmentally friendly, but we will live in a healthy and pollution-free environment. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Onu. Um, we're going to just go to a five minute break and get ready with more presentations afterwards. Thank you. Shanti, just to clarify, so we didn't hear um, Shima and Tasneem. So those two are missing. Yes, that is correct. Um, I haven't seen them jump on yet, so. So uh, who is next? Do you know? Um, well, hopefully both of them will come on and then we'll start with them. If not, we'll just jump to right after the break to okay. Arash. Yeah. Okay. Just just to let you know, Tasneem has withdrawn and uh, she's not going to present. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Right okay, sorry. That's right, Shahab, right now is what we're saying. Is that live on YouTube, just so we're aware? Sorry? Is what we're saying right now live on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you want to stop it? Uh, nope, that's fine. We'll just take a quick break here.
dear judge, everything is going well. Any thoughts or comments or any suggestions? I think it's going fairly well. Uh, are we live? Yeah, yeah, we are. No, I just are we on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just curious. No, it's good. It's working well. Okay. Since we are ahead of schedule, we're just going to give a little bit of time for our time to catch up. <laughs> so we'll get going here probably around 1020, if that's all right with everyone. Oh, okay. um, I saw Shima, you're on now. Um, that's great. Sorry, we're a bit ahead of time. Um, so we'll start with you right away at 1020, if that's all right. Okay. Well, if you if we are doing so well, then um, then you can give us a minute break between the it you could consider that i don't know how the judges other judges feel 30 seconds is good it's just yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah i'll be giving There's, you guys some more time yeah absolutely coffee or something yeah. yeah for sure it's a lot of information in three minutes that's for sure yeah thanks okay sounds good we tackled all technical issues so we're going smooth and we have lots of time
All right, we are just about ready to get going here. Um, get my video going here. All right, just a couple of reminders to all the participants. Please make sure to mute the live YouTube if you have that going, just so it doesn't give any extra um, background noise. And we will get started here right away. All right, another thing also for the participants on your slide, I'll be putting them on the live screen and you will see a countdown timer in the form of three circles. Once the orange circle is starting to disappear, uh, you're down to about 30 seconds. Um, so that gives you a bit of an idea as to how much time you have left. All right, so we'll have Shima uh, going first here right away. I see you're on the WebEx. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can awesome. hear Awesome. All right, so she will be presenting on production of algae liquid biofuel using novel heterogeneous catalysts. And let me just pull up your slide here. No, this is not mine. Yeah, sorry, yeah. the YouTube is just catching up there. Yeah, there you go. This looks like yours. All right. Uh, looks like all of our judges are back. So whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and I'll start the timer. All right. Uh, good day, everyone. This is Shima, a PhD student working under supervision of Dr. Dalai. And uh, today I present my work, which is about production of algal liquid biofuel using algal hydrochar-based catalysts. 
For the last few decades, by incremental human uh, population and energy consumption, there is a drastic increase in carbon dioxide uh, emission into environment by burning non-renewable fossil fuels. So um, more attention has been paid on, paid on a production of uh, renewable energy. And out of candidate biomass as a source of renewable energy, uh, microalgae has been considered uh, the most promising alternative for biofuel production because of its advantages such as higher um, photosynthesis efficiency, such as uh, like um, result in uh, carbon dioxide capture uh, from power plant, ability to be grown in um, wastewater and for the countries such as Canada, it uh, also can be grown in uh, indoors in photobioreactors. So we have microalgae, but how can we uh, produce green transportation fuel? All I have done in the lab can be divided into three sections. First process, which is called hydrothermal liquefaction used to produce the, uh, produce uh, bio crude oil. And of course, we had uh, residuals as byproduct uh, along with the uh, production of main product, which is uh, bio crude oil. Uh, and we call it hydrogen. And because utilization of a byproduct uh, result in improving the economics of overall process, uh, so I tried activation in order to produce highly porous activated carbon for subsequent process. But why we need subsequent process? Because um, bio crude oil uh, contains high amount of oxygenated compound and uh, high molecular weight compound in the range of vacuum gas oil, and uh, it needs upgradation in order to be used as transportation fuel. So. Catalytic hydrodeoxygenation over alcohol hydrochar based catalyst used to remove oxygenated compound and produce uh, green transportation fuel in the range of gasoline and diesel. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Shima. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, next, we are going to have Mahadiar. Um, if you can turn on your mic and camera there, uh, we'll give the judges a few moments uh, just to do their judging and we'll come right back with your presentation. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you, so that's perfect. We're just going to give the judges a few more moments and I'll come back and let you know when we'll start your presentation. Absolutely.
All right, you can go ahead with your presentation on capsule GAN for robust face super resolution. Sounds very interesting. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hello, everyone. What was your childhood dream? When I was a kid, people were still using cash. We had a printer in our home, and I was always thinking of printing money. Perhaps you have thought about it as well, but some people pursued their dream and actually did this. After a while, police will understand there are some fake dollar bills in the market. So they start investigating the case. They randomly check the bills for anomaly or printing errors. After a while, they'll learn how to find fake bills. So the criminals should print better dollar bills to deceive the cops. This game will continue and both groups will gradually getting better at their job. If the criminals have the talent, they will print fake money, which is indistinguishable from real bills. This is the idea behind Generative Adversarial Networks, GAN, which is one of the most popular AI models right now. I use two AI models competing with each other. One tries to make some fake images that are similar to real samples. The other model tries to realize which sample is fake and which one is real. At the end of the training process, the generator can create hyper-realistic samples. I have used GAN for super resolution. In other words, my model reconstructs the high resolution version of an image. Moreover, to improve the performance of my, of my model, I have used a double agent. I share the police strategies with the criminals and I teach the cops how fake money is printed. As a result, both groups can improve themselves faster. This concept is called multi-scale gradient GAN. You can see some sample results at the bottom, bottom of the slide. The left column is a low resolution image, and in the middle, you can see the output of the AI model, and the ground truth is on the right. Our criminals are doing their job perfectly. This model can solve many human problems, such as cancer detection. Uh, this is my current focus in my research. I'm applying this model to prostate MRI scans. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer worldwide, and one in seven Canadian men are diagnosed with this type of cancer through their lifetime. Tumors in the earliest stage are tiny. With, with this system, you can increase the resolution dramatically so the doctor can diagnose the disease at earliest stage and save many lives. So by letting AI models competing with each other as criminals and cops, we can make high resolution, accurate, realistic fake images from face images to MRI scans, even dollar bills. But remember, if you don't want to get caught, put the face of a real president on your fake dollar bills. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. It is a dream of everyone's deal just to print money. It grows on trees every day. All right, uh, next, let's see who we have on the chat, um, AJ. You have your mic and camera working. I see you're in there. Hello. Hi. Um, we'll have you present next. We're just going to give the judges a few moments uh, to conclude that last presentation. I'll come back and let you know when we're about to get started. For sure. Thanks.
All right, AJ, yeah, if you can get your camera and mic going there, um, we'll watch your presentation on modifying the secondary flow pattern to improve retention times in a vortex type stormwater retention pond. That's that's a mouthful, but I'm sure you're going to do a great job presenting it. So whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. And when you start, I'll be clicking the timer to get it going. Uh, AJ, we can't hear you for some reason. Uh, just pause it for a sec. Yeah, try, I, I, I could hear you before. Try now. Uh, no, we still can't hear you. Um, do you want to try leaving the meeting and then coming back in? Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead and do that and we'll see if that fixes the problem there. We'll just give them a couple seconds to join back in here. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you now. That's perfect. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and I'll start the timer. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's start by talking about how stormwater makes its way into our streams and rivers. So if rain falls on undeveloped areas such as our forests and grasslands, water infiltrates the soil and, and uh, ponds in open spaces and results in low runoff. However, when rain falls over impermeable surfaces like the streets and and houses in our cities, there is very little infiltration. Instead, this results in large urban runoff, which is conveyed to streams and rivers through our stormwater drainage networks. In both situations, it is common for runoff to carry sediments to our rivers. Sediments from undeveloped areas can provide nutrients to support the biodiversity in the rivers, while sediments carried by urban runoff can sometimes be detrimental. You see, rainfall over urban areas collects and transports several urban pollutants like salts, pesticides, fertilizers, and oil. Especially, sediments in urban runoff are a major environmental concern as they make the water turbid, reducing the sunlight available for photosynthesis and irritating fish gills. Sediments can also be a medium for the transport of other major pollutants like nitrogen, phosphorus, and heavy metals. So then, we recognize the need to control these solids and sediments from entering our rivers. This is not just with stormwater, but in also other sources of discharge, such as our wastewater and industrial effluents. Thankfully, this removal of sediments and solids is a well-studied process. During low-velocity flows, the sediments naturally settle at the bottom through gravity. So we simply need to provide large open spaces and long retention times in our separation systems. Now coming to my thesis, uh, vortex type separation devices are low energy hydraulic systems that can remove solids from water by subjecting the flow to a vortex type uh, flow pattern. They have found applications in combined sewer overflows, wastewater, industrial effluents, and of course, stormwater. So the advantage of vortex systems is that by offering a longer flow path and a longer retention time, we can achieve better removal efficiencies per unit area as compared to our conventional systems. This way, we can use our land resources more judiciously, especially with the growing urban population and rising land costs. Despite the potential advantages, it has been identified that a radial secondary flow can cause short circuiting and reduce retention times in these vortex systems. For my research, I'm trying to optimize the flow conditions by generating artificial secondary currents using veins so that the flow, uh, so that the flow pattern and the retention times are improved. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, AJ. I'm glad we got that all fixed up and you did a great job. Thank you. Uh, Amir, we're going to have you go next with your rock launcher presentation. Um, so we'll just double check your audio and camera there while the judges have a moment. Yeah, looks like I can see you hi, there. Hi. Yeah, hi, yeah hi, and I can hear you. So yeah. we'll just give the judges a moment and I'll come back and let you know when we're going to start your presentation. Sure.
All right, Amir, it looks like we're ready to go with your presentation. Uh, let me just get your slide up there. That would make all the difference. All right, you're going to be presenting to us on your rock launcher work. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and I'll start the timer. Thank you, Shanti. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the robot that we built in the University of Saskatchewan. But first, let's talk about uh, what this robot will do and the background of this robot. Um, if, you're, if you know Kelling, the Kelling stone is uh, famous for its unusual behavior. I said unusual because uh, if you grab a glass of water, you just spin it and uh, throw it down the table, you will see it will deviate to one side. And its deviation depends on the rotation uh, direction. Uh, so, for example, if it's uh, rotating clockwise, it will deviate to the left side. However, in Kelling stone, while the Kelling stone is going down the ice and it's spinning uh, clockwise, it will deviate to the right side. For a century, scientists tried to explain this behavior, and up to now, uh, none of them can explain it uh, quantitatively or qualitatively. And there is a gap there. What's the gap is the control of the variable of the research. For example, the velocity of the stone, uh, they couldn't um, control it as well that this robot can do. So uh, we designed this robot to control the linear rotational velocity of the Kelling stone and launch it down the ice at the preset, uh, preset angle to the long axis the ice sheet. Like every robot, it has three phases, designing, prototyping, and testing. In the designing uh, phase, we, we define and determine the criteria like the objectives and constraints. In the prototype, we built a prototype for this robot and we put it in the test in the test phase. Um, and we have some feedback from the prototype and it, this will iterate in this cycle and we do some modification with designing and do it again and again. Uh, meanwhile, in the testing, we have uh, some experiments results, which, which is really interesting for us. And uh, for example, researchers believe that the stone, the rotational motion of the stone caused this curl, but we found that in a specific range of linear rotational speed of the curling stone, the stone rotational motion has no significant effect on the stone's trajectory. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Amir. Uh, curling is definitely a hot topic right now, considering the Scotties is on. So that's really cool research. Well done. Thank you. All right, we're going to give a quick break. Arash, I see that you joined us here. So that's perfect. Um, can you just speak for a sec? Let's just make sure your mic is working. Can you hear me, guys? I can hear you. All right. Um, so we'll just give the judges a second after that last presentation. I'll come back and let you know when we're going to start yours. Hi, Arash. Looks like we're ready to go. Just make sure you mute your YouTube video if you have that streaming as well, just so we don't get any interference there. You're good? All right. Awesome. Uh, so whenever you're ready, you can go ahead with your presentation on novel materials for hemodialysis. Sure. Okay. So, hello, guys. Today, I'm going to tell you a real story of the artificials. As humans, we have always uh, made something artificial 
uh, with a purpose behind it. For example, we have made plastic dolls uh, because we wanted princes and princesses for our own imaginary childhood world, not knowing that they would remain our friends for such a long time. We've made artificial grasses, for example, because we were concerned about the greenness of our backyards and our playgrounds, uh, not knowing that we would lose our rabbits or birds on nature, and we would expose uh, our children to cancer developing materials. Uh, we've always done this. We've always made something to compensate our lackings and our loneliness. And I think the hero of such an act is Father Geppetto, who made Pinocchio for his own loneliness. Uh, what Geppetto, like so many other researchers, didn't know that making artificial humans, or even a part of artificial, part of human, which is artificial organ, would be uh, such a challenging job. A great example of this is uh, artificial kidney or hemodialysis devices. So here is what happens. Uh, when people go through hemodialysis, their blood reacts with those polymeric filters. As a result, uh, the immune system gets activated, then inflammation, then cardiovascular shocks, then so many other shocks, then death. Uh, a part of the problem is that there are so many reactions and we don't know what kind of reactions are there. Uh, the other part of the problem is that uh, no matter what kind of reactions, we can't control them. So here is what we are doing right now. We are taking blood polymers, uh, we, are, we are taking blood proteins and polymers and we are putting them in a cage and we politely ask them to fight. That's called computational chemistry, molecular dynamic simulation. When we get the interactions and the guilty ones, we design polymers and we synthesize them, uh, the better ones through organic chemistry and we fabricate the membranes, the filters through electro spinning to get a slightly better, more compatible or let's say blood compatible filters. Uh, I know that those patients, kidney failure patients, would not remember what we have contributed to the science. Uh, they can't keep it in their head, well, because mostly they are old, but what we have done will always remain in, the, in their blood till the very end, which is uh, hopefully a little bit longer. Wonderful, thank you, Arash. All right, next we'll go on with Eric Yang. Um, I see you've joined us there. We'll uh, just yes. uh, yeah, just turn on your camera and your mic. We'll give the judges a bit of time with the last presentation and I'll come back and let you know when we'll start. All right, Eric, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead with your presentation on a novel method for air quality control inside livestock buildings using engineered water nanostructures. Sounds very complex. So whenever you're ready, you can start and I'll just start the timer at the same time. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Air quality is really important for both humans and animals. Let's take a look at these images on the tab 
top left here, those chickens from commercial barn are suffering the bad air quality that's full of pathogens and dust particles. So we know that we can't force these set chickens to wear the N95 mask 24 seven, unless we don't feed them and the chicken farmers won't be happy. So there are currently two major treatment options uh, for air disinfection. The first one is using the UV light, but we know that this technology has some potential health risk problems for both bar workers and animals. And the second one is the using the HEPA filter, but due to the high dust and the pathogen concentration in the commercial barn, so a regular cleaning and a replacement are needed. So that's gonna potentially increase the operating cost. There is the no air treatment option that is using nano-sized water droplets. And this technology only consumes a little amount of water and electricity. But unfortunately, that has been developed yet. So that's where I'm coming to play. To tell you a bit about how, my per how I've done this and about my project, let's take a look at how this nano-sized droplets be generated. So on the figure on the left is a basic setup of an electro spray. We apply the high voltage between the capillary and the counter electrode plate. At the same time, we feed the water into the capillary because of the electrical potential. So the water is going to drive in towards the counter electrode plate and form the spray. And that's what you see from the image in the middle. And because this sprayed water droplets carry the same type of charge, so they hit each other and they're going to split into the finer and finer droplets. And until we get the nano sized water droplets, and that's what, that is what you see on the right hand side there. And because these water droplets are nanoscale, so they have some unique physical and chemical properties, such as they can stay much longer time uh, in the air with much smaller evaporation rate. And also they are highly charged. So that means they're pretty happy to move around to meet those enemies, such as dust particles and pathogens. No, when we treat the air with these nano sized water droplets, the reactive oxygen species inside the water droplets will target the pathogen's membrane, RNA, and the DNA component specifically, and the pathogens get killed without affecting humans and animals. As a result, the air quality inside the commercial barn gets improved by using these nano-sized water droplets, and now we make both chicken and the farmers happy. Thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I thought the idea of putting N95 masks on chickens would be a little bit difficult. So <laughs> good animation on the Photoshop there. That was really well done. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep, for sure. Uh, and Tim, I see that you've joined us. Um, we'll just have you turn on your camera and your mic. We'll make sure that that's all working and give the judges a bit of time to wrap up the last presentation. Awesome. If you can unmute yourself, we'll just make sure we can hear you. Uh, press the unmute there. Looks like you're still muted. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Perfect. All right, we'll just give the judges a few moments. I'll come back and let you know when we start your presentation.
All right. I it looks like we're ready to go ahead with your presentation. Um, I'll just have you mute your YouTube. If you're watching YouTube live. It sounds like we have some feedback going on there. All right, perfect. Um, your presentation on preparation of high performance titanium based self cleaning glass using a plasma technique. Sounds like it's pretty intense. So go ahead and share with us what you're working on. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I want to talk about an issue that many of you may encounter. When you want to get a new house, you may be looking for the ones with more and bigger windows to see the beauty surrounding you, the landscapes, rain, and the flying birds. Of course, this will come at a price. You must clean your windows regularly to enjoy as you want it. It may look easy, but uh, what are you going to do if you are living in a tower? It's too dangerous to get out and clean the numerous glasses out there. You may want to hire some specialists to do it for you, but uh, it's costly, risky, and uh, of course, time consuming. It's interesting to know that it will take about three months for the climbers, yes, the climbers, to clean the glasses of the Khalifa Tower as the world's tallest building. But what if the glasses continuously clean themselves? Sounds impossible, but it's true. Titania is a white powder with many interesting characteristics. When exposed to the sunlight, uh, it can eliminate numerous pollutants came in contact with. In this research, we want to use the potential of innovative plasma technologies, the fourth state of the matter, to help fabricate efficient self-cleaning glasses in a simple and cost-effective procedure. When exposed to the certain types of plasmas, uh, Materials can uh, change and uh, their fundamental properties will change. Uh, titania, when exposed to the plasma, can uh, change its properties and even at the low sunlight, it will be effective and prevent the adhesion of the water droplets on its surface at the same time. This will make it more effective it's even at a cloudy day and help, enjoy, help you enjoy the rain and watching the droplets coming down the building and uh, without leaving any traces or dirt on your glasses. Okay, uh, with all these advantages, let's apply it on our windows. But it's still a white powder and totally obscures your vision. Here is the plasma helping us once again. The plasma ELD technique can act like a spray, which can disperse atoms instead of small liquid droplets. Uh, we can form uh, a very thin layer of titania, our glass, which is invisible to the naked eye and doesn't change the optical properties of the original glass. Now, thanks to the plasmas, we have an effective and cheap self-cleaning windows to enjoy and at the same time eliminate some organic pollutants from the air and help clean the environment too. Thank you. That was my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. I definitely want that coating as soon as it's on the market. <laughs> Cleaning windows is not one of my favorite jobs. No, very cool research. Thank you. All right, next we'll have Olivia. Um, we're just going to give the judges a few moments uh, to wrap up that last presentation. I'll come back and we'll let you know when you can get started. Shanti, can you hear me? I sure can. That works really good. Awesome.
All right, looks like we're ready to get started. Uh, Olivia, your presentation on climate change, carbon dioxide capture from one of the large industries using carbon-based sorbents under simulated post-combustion scenario. Sounds very cool. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and I'll start the timer. I'm ready. A couple of years ago, if any one of you have told me that a cup of coffee would make a difference towards climate change, or coffee is going to become an integral portion of my research, I would have not agreed. But today, I do. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about utilizing spent coffee grounds for carbon dioxide mitigation, a solution towards climate change. Firstly, let me highlight the problems. The major problem that we all are familiar of is global warming and climate change. Thanks to Greta Thunberg and the hashtag challenges that went viral on social media platforms. The rising temperature is because of the excessive emission of carbon dioxide from the industries that will continue to terrorize our planet. Another problem that we are less familiar of is coffee. Oh, no, no, don't worry. It's still going to be everyone's favorite hot beverage in Canada, including me. And why not? If it's minus 10 degrees Celsius outside, you would definitely need a favorite latte or mocha to go. But because of this tremendous popularity, a huge amount of waste is generated in million tons called spent coffee grounds, which is usually discarded in landfills. However, spent coffee grounds have shown some interesting inherent physical and chemical traits that could be valorized to produce value added product like activated carbon. So in my research, I am using an approach to collect the waste and convert it into a value added product like activated carbon through thermal treatment, which would further be exploited to capture carbon dioxide from the industries such that nothing emits into the atmosphere. Interestingly, the way coffee is produced from the farm to your cup is similar to the way activated carbon is synthesized. In the former, attention is given to stages like farming, brewing, roasting to get the best aroma out of coffee beans. And in the later, production and capture performance is optimized by researcher like me to get a carbon sample with pertinent surface chemistry and textural properties to attract more and more carbon dioxide molecules, like a perfect cup of coffee would do to a coffee lover like me. Not only that, we are also proposing a carbon negative strategy because carbon dioxide, once captured, could be utilized to produce value added products as well as clean fuel. Hence, through my research, I am proposing a carbon negative strategy that gives us some hope to fight against climate change and would eventually generate wealth. These days, while having my favorite cup of latte or mocha or even iced coffee, I do not fear the existence of planet B because in reality, the problem is taken care of, which could be easily retrofitted to any existing industries. Keep drinking coffee and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olivia. I'm very glad to hear I can keep drinking coffee. I, I'm an equal coffee lover, so that's very good. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll have Ninu. Uh, so if you can turn on your camera and then mute your mic, we'll just make sure that's good to go while the judges wrap up that last presentation. Perfect, I can see you. If you can unmute your mic, we'll make sure that we have sound working. Hey, can you hear me? I sure can, perfect. All right, we'll give the judges a bit of time and I'll come back and let you know when we'll start your presentation. Thank you.
All right, Nina, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and I'll start the timer. Okay, um, just a second. Okay, I'm ready. Good morning, everybody. The world population is following a rising trend. The demand for food proteins is rising in parallel with this growing population. In this situation, a question I have is, do we have enough sustainable protein sources to feed the growing population? I would like to talk to you about a viable source of plant protein that could be a future protein source. Most of you would have heard of canola. When we hear about canola, what that comes to our mind would be canola oil, as many of us would be using that as a cooking oil in our kitchen. Along with high amount of oil content, canola seeds contain around 20 percentage of proteins. However, the current oil extraction technology involves high temperature operation that alters the protein structure and make them not suitable for human consumption. The solid that is over after oil extraction is the canola meal and it contains around 40 percentage of proteins and is a rich protein source. So what are we doing with this rich protein source? Personally, they hold a good market as a livestock feed, livestock farming for producing proteins for human consumption also involves the use of many additional resources like land, water, and energy. So considering the growing population, these animal-based proteins may not be a sustainable option. And that's why we need alternative protein sources like canola. So what can we do now? If we could develop a technology to separate the proteins from the non-protein components in the meal and make them suitable for human food application, we are producing a sustainable protein source that right for the planet. My research is focusing on developing a cold press technology, a low temperature process for producing oil and meal from canola and on further extracting proteins from this meal. You have developed a technology. You need to make sure the technology is technically and economically feasible. In order to ensure that, I'm also doing a techno-economic analysis of the technology in my research. I hope my research will take us one step closer in making these alternative proteins available in the market for the growing population. Thank you. Thank you, Ninu. That is very cool research. Coming from a farm background, I love canola and any more uses we can use for it, that's super big. I like that. Good job. Uh, next, we'll be having Elnez, um, your presentation. Um, can you just turn on your mic and your camera? We'll just make sure that's good to go while the judges wrap up after that last presentation. Elnez, can you hear me? We'll give him just a moment. Hello. Uh. Oh, there you are. Perfect. Here's my turn. Yeah, it'll be your turn next. Absolutely. For sure. Um, oh, your name is just back on here. So Zara, you'll be yes. next. Yeah. For sure. Uh, we'll just give the judges a few more minutes to wrap up and then I'll let you know when you can start. Sure. I don't have the right presentation up though. Yours is on, correct? Make sure. Mine is the next one, excuse me. Okay. 
Can you see that one? Pardon? Are you following along on the YouTube? Which slides on YouTube? It's not it's my not. presentation. Oh. Um, the so next one. Good field. All right, we'll try this one. Yes. Perfect. All right, we'll go with that one. Uh, looks like the judges are just about ready. Um, so you'll be presenting on synthesis of liquid fuels through Fischer Tropsy synthesis. Sounds very in depth. Looking forward to it. Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and I'll start the timer. <clears throat> I'm ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, all of this, I want to tell you a story, uh, a sad one, but make sure that the end I will be happy. Today, almost all of us. After a day. And it mainly comes from our activities as a human being. Uh, for example, the cars and industries were contains large amounts of sulfur and aromatic compounds. And these compounds is the main cause for air pollution. So who will pay the price for this pollution? Uh, the environment, the plants, animals, or maybe our next generation. So it's time for us to face the music and take an action be uh, uh, before it gets too late to do any uh, efficient work. So from now on, the happy ending is starting. During my project, I'm working on a technology called Feature Trops, which in short, we call it FD, to produce clean fuels. I mean, zero amount of sulfur, aromatics with gasoline, diesel, and jet fuels. These technologies consist of three steps. The first step is seeing gas production, a combination of carbon monoxide and hydrogen molecules. The second is fissure to rupture reaction, followed by products upgrading. Our focus in this project is on the uh, heart of this technology, which is the uh, second section. In this section, CO and hydrogen molecules are converting uh, to long chain of uh, carbon and hydrogen molecules by existence of catalyst. So the catalyst is our most precious materials uh, in uh, this step. So what we do with our precious and valuable materials, we always take care of them seriously. For example, we shield them in a box or wrap them with a present paper to uh, keep them safe. Why don't we do the same thing with our catalyst? We will do it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, in Saskatchewan, one of the most beautiful scenes, especially in spring and summer seasons, are canola fields. This yellowish and beautiful uh, flower with outstanding uh, view. Whenever we uh, think about canola hall, the canola, uh, uh, the only uh, word to come to our mind is the cooking oil. But what about the waste from this beautiful uh, plant? I mean, the meal and the canola hulls. I have a better idea. We can use, uh, better use these uh, waste and instead of uh, just collecting them as landfill or burn it, uh, burn them to uh, produce heat. I'm using this uh, waste uh, to uh, wrap uh, my metal inside these uh, canola hulls, just like a present paper to. Uh, keep my metal so safe and so active. By doing this, I'm trying to effectively prolong the catalyst lifetime and decreasing its deactivation chance to effectively produce clean fuels with zero amount of sulfur and aromatics. So when I pass a canola from now on, I get more beauty even in fall season. Thank you. Wonderful. So much, Zara. I love all this research going into canola fields because I agree with you. They are the most beautiful part of summertime. So well done. Thank you for that. Uh, next, we'll be having Elnaz do their presentation. Uh, Elnaz, can you please turn on your camera and unmute yourself? We'll just make sure that that's all good to go. Hi. So am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you and I can see you. Awesome. We'll just let the judges have a few moments to double check and make sure everything's working. And then I'll announce you in. Thank you.
All right, Alma, it looks like we're ready to go. Um, so your presentation on is erosion detection in pipelines using fluid dynamic pressure response analysis. Uh, sounds like a big project. Looking forward to hearing about it. Whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead and I'll start the timer. Okay, great. Hello, everyone, uh, and thanks, Ranti. Uh, my name is Elnaz. My research project is erosion detection in pipelines using fluid dynamic pressure response analysis, a big word, under supervision of Professor Travis Spence. So what we do here is that uh, pipelines are very common in industries. That's what I want to talk about. And uh, they're used in, let's say, hydraulics uh, industries, water transportation, of refining materials, which is the focus of this research. Whenever we're having these refining materials, there are solid particles moving in the pipe, scratching the inner surface of the pipe and resulting in wall thinning, which we call erosion. And if it's not monitored and treated well, it can result in leakage, which is, uh, which is a really bad thing. It can be uh, undesirable to like economics and uh, environment. It can even be hazardous to living organism. So the best thing here is to prevent leakage from happening at the first place. That's why there are uh, different methods and techniques out there to uh, simply monitor a uh, pipeline integrity. We call it pipeline condition monitoring like fiber optic sensors, guided wave techniques, and smart peaks, but they are either costly or uh, they cannot be used for like longer pipelines. That's why we are working on dynamic pressure response analysis. What we do here is that we excite pressure at inlet, which is where the flow goes in, and we look at the impulse response of the pressure at inlet and outlet. Inlet is where the flow goes in, and outlet is where does it come out. And uh, by just looking at this impulse response, we can tell what's happening inside the pipe. So we don't go there. We don't take a look at it from inside the pipe, but just with look at these numbers, we can tell where erosion happens. We call it the location of it, how long it is, the length of it, and how severe it is, uh, the depth of it. Do we need to change the pipe? Do we need to uh, like just let it run and then everything will be fine? Yeah, that's basically what we do here. So we uh, insert pressure, we look at the impulse response, and then uh, we can tell if the pipeline is still fine to run or we need to change some part of it. And that's actually pretty amazing because we don't we don't need to do anything special about it. And it's uh, pretty um, cheap, I can tell. And whenever we're having this like wall thinning, we get some reflections. That's uh, basically how we work. So we having uh, this time delay and wave propagation speed, we can tell what's happening inside the pipe. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you for your time. Well done, Elnaz. That's very cool work. And I like how excited you are about it. That's super yeah, Thanks. Well done. Thank All you. right, next we'll be having Amit. Uh, so if you can turn on your mic and your camera, we'll just make sure everything's good. Oh, there you are. That was quick. Perfect. I'll get your slide up here. We'll give the judges the time there. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this one's yours. So I'll let you know when the judges are ready to go in just a few moments here. Okay, thank you. All right, um, and, uh looks like we're ready to go here. And your presentation is on plasma treatment of PVDF slash nanofibers. Uh, sounds really cool. Whenever you're ready, 
have at her and I'll start the timer. I really love watching movies on the big screen, but this pandemic has changed the world around us and we are all adapting. For example, it's been a year that I only watch movies at home on Netflix. Thankfully, I am still able to enjoy my favorite noisy, crunchy snack that goes great with movies. Just a slide a pack of kernels into the microwave and in two minutes, boom, movie style popcorns are ready to go. And what amazes me the most is that how popping popcorn in a microwave is similar to my research. I work on implantable devices specifically to improve physical feature of a type of plastic material. One of the features of this plastic is that it repels water or it has water phobia. We call this repelling feature hydrophobicity. But why is that important? Well, because over 90% of blood is water and the purpose of this plastic is to be used inside the human body. So I need to do something about its hydrophobicity. But how? One way is to modify the material surface to a degree that it not only accepts water, but also soaks it up. To do this modification, I use the oxygen plasma machine shown here on the bottom center. What this machine does to the material surface is similar to what a microwave does to corn kernels. When I place the kernel pack inside the microwave and turn it on, a type of wave generates heat inside the kernel cores to a point where they pop. Similarly, I set the plastic sheet inside the oxygen field chamber of the plasma treatment device. Once the chamber is sealed, Electrom electromagnetic waves excite the oxygen gas molecules. These highly excited and charged particles are just like kernels and they start to pop and they go to different direction. And also they start to strike the surface of the plastic sheet, which is present inside the chamber. If the number of such impact is high enough, the surface structure will be modified in a way that it can absorb water. So, Problem solved? No! Have you ever tried to make popcorn, but either ended up with burnt popcorn or mostly unpopped kernels? That is when you know that the right combination of power and time were not used. Similarly, achieving the desired level of plasma treatment requires fine tuning of several parameters, such as gas pressure, the chamber size, the power, and time. I mean, by the way, who doesn't like a fully fluffy popcorn? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ahmed. That was a great correlation between popcorn and your research. That was very well done, thank you. Thank you so Absolutely. much for the opportunity. Absolutely. All right, next we'll be having Maha Renak. Sorry if I mispronounced that. <laughs> Uh, if you can turn on your mic and your camera. Perfect. There, I see you there. Um, Shanti, can you hear me? I can hear you. That's perfect. Okay, we'll give the judges just a little time to wrap up the last presentation and I'll come back and we'll get you started. Okay.
All right, looks like we're ready to go here with your presentation on removal of volatile organic compounds as a common indoor pollutants from air using catalytic o ozonization. Very cool. I'm very <laughs> um, looking forward to hearing what that's all about. Go ahead whenever you're ready and I'll start the timer. Sure, I'm ready. Hello, everyone. When we think of air pollution, we might think about being in crowded cities that is not possible to see the blue sky because air pollution even impacts visibility. But air pollution is not limited to outdoors and we are not completely safe in indoor environment. We might not realize it, but there are hundreds of chemicals in our homes, in our workplace, chemicals that we are unwillingly inhaling them every day. VOCs are volatile organic compounds that are one of the most common chemicals in indoor air. They are emitted as gases from either solids or liquids. The amount of these chemicals can be considerably high in the, in the air we breathe in our homes. So where do VOCs come from? VOCs are coming out of the thing that we own, such as furniture, paintings, carpets, kitchen cabinets, and cleaning detergents. It's not only chemicals in the air that is the concern, but chemicals that have bad health effects. And since we are breathing them in, it's going to affect our lung, our heart, and can lead to increased cancer risk. So now the question would be, how can we get rid of these harmful chemicals? In our research, we're using a technology called catalytic ozonation to destroy these VOCs in air. We use ozone, which is a highly reactive gas and composed of three oxygen atoms to react with the VOC molecule. We also use catalysts to speed up the reaction and lower the amount of energy required for this reaction to happen. The reaction products mainly are carbon dioxide and water vapor. As we talk about the presence of these pollutants in our homes, we should be able to destroy these VOCs at a temperature close to room temperature, right? Now, the challenge of using this technique is that catalytic reaction using the catalyst and ozone requires a little bit higher temperature than room temperature to perform perfectly and to remove all these nasty chemicals. Until we get to that point to use this technology safely and with high efficiency at room temperature, we cannot have a practical application of that. Ozone has a lot of potential to be used as a cleaning agent. Currently, it's been using to remove odors and pollutants in water treatment industry commercially. Our goal is to use its potential and bring it to the air pollution control devices as well. In our research group, we are investigating different approaches to develop this technology. In my project, I'm focusing on the catalyst itself and trying to design and prepare a more efficient catalyst for removal of these pollutants. The result of my study will allow us to remove catalytic, to improve catalytic ozonation technology as an indoor air purification system. These days that we spend more and more time in our home and each and every day new viruses showing up, it's very important that people stay safe in their homes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And you are so right how important it is to have clean air. Like, that's, that's huge. And thank you so much for that research. That's really cool to see. Well done. Uh, thank you. Next, we'll go on to Saeed. Uh, if you can turn on your mic and camera, perfect, I can see you there. If you just want to say something so we can make sure that's working. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Absolutely, perfect. We'll just let the judges uh, have a moment to finish up that last presentation, and then we'll get going on yours. All right.
All right, so he looks like we're ready to get going. Uh, your presentation is on road safety analysis using machine learning algorithms. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and I'll start the timer. Good morning, everyone. This is Said from the Civil Engineering Department, and my research is about road safety analysis using machine learning algorithms. So let's just start off by giving you some facts that makes this research quite important. According to World Health Organization, 1.35 million people are being killed on the roads. Um, this number is around the population of cities like San Diego, Calgary, or the city of Prague. 20 to 50 million people are getting injured on the road each, each year, let aside the, the crashes with no injury. We all know that this poses a huge burden on societies, especially when we notice that car accidents are the first cause of death among the young generation. In fact, if you haven't noticed, since I started talking, one person has been the victim of car accident. One person is one too many. Transportation engineering and more specifically road safety specialists are aimed at tackling this problem. There are many factors contributing to the high number of car accidents from uh, human and vehicle factors to environmental factors. And however, transportation engineers are focused on working on transportation infrastructure such as roads, bridges, and intersections to make treatments that will increase the safety of these locations. So to build and treat transportation infrastructure efficiently, it is important and it is mentioned to go through a process called road safety management, as you can see on the figure. As part of this process, network screen screening is quite important because it prioritizes the locations where we need to put our resources, such as money and uh, our human resources, the most. In Saskatchewan only, during the years of 2013 and 2015, more than $20 million have been invested on these hazardous locations to treat them and to make them more safe. So it is quite important to recognize these locations correctly. In our research in the University of Saskatchewan, we are going to use machine learning and perform network screening to find the most hazardous locations in Saskatoon. Machine learning has already been proved that in terms of uh, prediction accuracy for crash frequency or crash severity in location is acting better than the traditional regression models. However, this is not enough. We are going to dig deeper in road safety management practices and we are going to see how it will work. So um, we are going to use 150 of Saskatchewan intersections and we are going to develop our machine learning models. And we already seen that the model, the machine learning model is providing us with more consistent uh, sites when we rank the sites. Um, in case you haven't noticed, on the right, you can see the decision tree, which is one of our main uh, algorithms that we use in this research. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. As someone who's been in a car accident in Saskatoon, I very much appreciate this research. That's really good to see. All right. Thank well, you. that concludes all of our presentations. Thank you so much to all of our presenters and to the judges um, and to the IT team. That went pretty smooth. Uh, really good to see. Uh, so the judges are going to have some time just to compile their results. And while they're doing that, we're going to have the first photo contest winners announced, then we'll go on to the audience choice election. Now, to be able to vote for your audience choice, uh, the link is now live for the survey monkey. You'll see it in the chat at the side of this live feed or on the um, engineering website. The, the link will be there as well. So you can vote on your first and second choice uh, for the presenters. And then we'll go on with a couple speeches and announce the winners. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Are we still on YouTube or how do we do this? <clears throat> I'm going to uh, start a breakout session for you, Judge, so that yeah, you can go there and decide.
How do we go there? I. Did you join? Oh, so we have to go into the breakout session tab. Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, the judging panel on the right. On the participants panel, there's a breakout session name is judging panel. Oh, participant. No, I don't see that. What, what do you I do? see that, but it cannot. It, it's not. Point. Yeah, it's not the, the link or the. It's
I think we should be live now. Shanti, we are live. You can start. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry for the long wait, but that's how it goes. We're trying to connect people from everywhere across the province to come up with a decision of who could possibly. We have noise. Sorry, Shanti. We have noise. Noise? Yeah. It's your sound. Um, there's nothing else planned. So, can you hear me clear now? Sorry about that. No. Um, I don't know what happened, but it's when you're talking, there's a noise with your Only when I'm talking? Yeah, yeah. it's good. It's good. good, good, good. Okay, you mute yourself. Okay. All right. So sorry about that. Like I was saying, technical difficulties. Am I a little clearer now? Yeah? All right. We'll just go with it. So welcome back. Uh, first, we're going to be talking about the photo contest winners. Uh, so Ken, I believe, Hamad, are you doing the photo contest winner presentation? Uh, yes, Shanti. So can I, can I share my screen? You can. You should have presentation abilities there. OK. Just a second. Uh, now you should you should see my screen. Uh, Shandi, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So, yeah, uh, as everyone knows, we had a photo contest for our graduate students, and people sent their pictures, their images for three different categories of research during pandemic, uh, their research and also campus and city life. So uh, we, we sent these pictures to our judges, uh, which we had actually three judges. Uh, one was Ta uh, Tammy Halpi, our graduate programs coordinator. Uh, the, the other person was Mohammed Majdabadi, graphic designer at Dyer Style. And the third person was Said Anwar, night sky and nature photographer. So they, they, they chose their uh, uh, choices and based, their, uh, based on their choices, the winners were for, for the first uh, category of research, di research during pandemic, Nazanin Chachi. Uh, the, caption, the caption for her image was working from Dinoland. Picture is clear, no need to feel, feel, uh, further exp explanation. Typical PhD student mimes life in pandemic. So congratulations to Nazanin. Uh, for winning this prize for this category. And the next category was the, the research of the students, and the winner was Vinay Bargov. And the caption for uh, his or her picture was Don't let our hopes evaporate in the thin air this pandemic. This was actually a cool picture. I also like this one. Uh, so, congratulations to Vinay for winning the prize. And the third category was campus and city life. And the winner is Mahdiar Molasani. And he, he, took, uh, he took a picture from the bridge and the river uh, while it was a sunset. It was a very cool picture. And congratulations to Mahdiar. The caption that he put for this picture was the city of bridges in the land of living skies. 
Yeah, so congratulations to all the winners. And I would like to ask uh, the winners to send me uh, an email. I will put my email in the chat box. They can send me an email, uh, then I, I will have their info to like uh, provide them the, their prizes. Thank you, Shanti. Perfect. Thank you, Hamad. Awesome. Am I a bit clearer now? Mm, no, you, you, your voice still has some like noises. The quality is not good, actually. Okay. Um, let me just rejoin. Give me half a sec. Sorry about this, guys. No problem. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's perfect, thank you. Wonderful, perfect. All right, so according to the audience, actually to jump on that, we have our audience choice presentation, and that goes to Amir Ravenbod. Congratulations for your work on the rock launcher and your presentation, it won the audience choice. So it sounds like uh, I heard a bit, we had so many uh, votes for our audience choice. That was really good to see, really good to see. Um, so we'll be getting you a prize for that. Uh, now we'll go on to our speech from Dr. Simonson, and he's got a bit of a presentation for us there. So Simonson, feel free to share your screen and should be good to go. Well, Thank you, Shante, and uh, you know I really have to say thank you, Shante. We moved through this uh, three-minute thesis competition very efficiently, and maybe as the judges felt at some point too efficiently. And a lot of that credit goes to you, Shante, uh, for being uh, you know keeping us on time, moving us forward, and adapting on the. Not a wonder you won last year with those with those great skills uh, coupled to your excellent speaking skills. So thanks, thanks a lot for the work you did. Um, you know, thanks to the speakers. Congratulations as well. Great presentations. We can see the judges had a little needed a little extra time to decide who they're going to pick uh, for the winner. So congratulations to all you. I hope you learned as much as we learned from this event. And also to the audience, thanks to those that attended. Consistently 30 to 40 listeners throughout the event, plus those that were in the uh, in the uh, in the speaking room, you know, when and, and I heard over 150, maybe nearly 200 votes for the uh, People's Choice Award. So we've touched a lot of people today. Thanks to the audience for joining, and to your judges. I know. You learned, but you had had a difficult job and we appreciate you taking your time to share your expertise and then help us select a winner and, and provide feedback. And of course, we're very interested in waiting to hear the results. I should also thank the Engineering Advancement Trust for sponsoring this event. A really important showcase of the research uh, in our college and a chance for students to get experience sharing their research at a different level. In the College of Engineering, we have a, a strategic plan that talks about many things, teaching, research, undergraduate, graduate students. And I just wanted to take a moment to mention this in our engineering uh, strategic plan, which goes from 2018 to 25. We have specific goals related to graduate studies, expanding the complement, providing superior graduate student experience and developing well-rounded leaders. And we can see from an event like today, this uh, event improves the graduate student experience and helps to nourish this leadership, which people skills and presentation communication is, is so important. And so thanks to the EGCC for arranging this event. 
In our strategic plan, we talk about engineering for, for five main areas, agriculture, environment, health, sustainable energy, and mining and minerals. And as I listened to the talks today, it was interesting to see that really we had a broad representation of all of these key areas. And I, and I somewhat uh, tried to break them down into different areas as the talks were, were taking place. But it was interesting that other than mining and minerals, we had a strong representation from all the areas, agriculture, environment, health, and sustainable energy, equally mixed right around one-fifth in each of those areas. And then we had, uh, you know, several presentations that didn't fit into any of those. In fact, the, the winner's choice was one with the curling rock launcher that I didn't place in into any one of those areas but we had other things like road safety data security pipeline erosion but you know so we kind of have a one-fifth split around the the four major areas and then other 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 areas so it's really nice to see that the research is going on and in our strategic areas which are all very important for for saskatchewan uh, but also for the world as we want to be and work towards and are the university the world needs. I would just also remind that in, in the graduate programs, we have six major graduate programs. Uh, five uh, were identified by the organizers of the 3MT. They combined a graduate program in chemical engineering together with a graduate program in, in, in biological engineering. And those two programs had half of the uh, participants. So a lot of representation from chemical and biological, and then uh, somewhat uh, evenly distributed around civil, uh, electrical, mechanical, and a few, uh, I think there was one in, in that was represented in, in biomedical. And also we had a good representation of both PhD and master students. So we have about 400 students in the college. Uh, so, you know, only about a little over 5% participated today, but this is above what we had last year. So it's good to see the growth. And the number of faculty representative, we had about 20% of our faculty represented. So we saw about 15 to 20% of the faculty research uh, going on in the college. And we can see that there's a broad range of research that's really having meaningful impact and you graduate students, all of you, and especially those that you, that presented, we can clearly see that your research is helping us solve world problems right here in Saskatchewan. So congratulations to everyone. I won't take any more of your time as we're waiting anxiously to see what the judges, who the judges will award the prizes. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Simonson. Really appreciate those kind words. It's been really fun being a part of this today, for sure. Um, now we'll have Bert uh, present the long-awaited winners. So Bert, go ahead. Uh, we're very excited and looking forward to it. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I just want to take a second to congratulate the organizers uh, very well without uh, much of a hitch anywhere. Uh, really well done. And I thank you too to all the presenters. I, I came into this hoping for a glimpse of the future and where engineering would take us. And I can say I was not disappointed at all. Um, all very good presentations. Many were ex excellent. Uh, and quite a few were actually exceptional. In fact, uh, for the judges, it was uh, it was quite a challenge because there were a number of, of uh, presentations that scored well over 80, and uh, it was it was very difficult to uh, to separate. Uh, four points, I think, separated first from fifth, uh, and that's uh, that's pretty tremendous. I think you all deserve congratulations for the effort you put in, and for the research you're and the difference you're going to make in society. So with that said, uh, let me just say that um, uh, we had a very difficult time getting to three points uh, or three, three. So 
I, I want to mention particularly before we get into the final three, uh, Olivia and uh, Maranath, who I think deserve special mention because they, for uh, for simple mathematics, they certainly could have been in uh, second or third place uh, easily uh, as well. Very good, uh, very good presentations, both of you. Now for the actual third place, as it turns out, um, we uh, we awarded that to uh, the participant Eric. Uh, second place we awarded to uh, the twentieth uh, participant uh, Ninu, and uh, the first place position we awarded to the eighth uh, presenter uh, Khaled. So uh, there. Oh, um, awesome, awesome, everyone. And if there were comments that I would make on the presentations, um, many of you could relax a bit more. Uh, it's it's um, difficult to do, I know, when you're doing a presentation, even more so when you're doing a presentation to a flat screen and can't read your audience. But uh, just always take a breath before you uh, before you start. Relax a bit. And there is no harm at all for any of you to stress just a little more the work that you're doing and the impact that your work specifically is having on, on society or on the planet or even on the economy that uh, we live in, because that is our role as engineers, uh, is the uh, preservation and protection of all three of those factors. So. Tremendous job. Thank you all very much. Uh, I really enjoyed my morning. Thank you so much, Bert. I think you speak for all the judges. That's for sure. And actually, we would really like to hear, I know the presenter, as a presenter, I really appreciate hearing judges' feedback and seeing where I can improve um, in any way possible. So I'll open it up for the judges to give some feedback to all the presenters or specific areas, whatever you see fit. Um, I'll go next if it's okay. <laughs> um, just very briefly. So thank you everyone. Uh, the, the presentations were excellent. I learned a lot. And uh, thank you for the organizers, uh, Shanti and Shahab and everybody else in the background. I think it went amazingly well. And thank you, like every detail you thought you were, it was very thoughtful. So you thought about a lot of details. It was so well organized. Um, I wanna say what I applaud in, in the different presentations that I heard. Each one, I learned something from each one. So all, or everyone, all of those were great. I really applaud do, those who, like everybody who put themselves in the spotlight. It's difficult. And it's it's true what you're saying, Bert. Um, try to relax. It's actually for people with an accent, especially when <laughs> English is not your first language. It's very difficult. It's like ten times more difficult because you cannot just pull out a word out of you know thin air. You actually really have to think about what word you're going to use. So um, practice, practice, practice. I think that's great, and it looked like a lot of you practiced a lot. Um, I really appreciated those who were obviously not reading it because some of you were obviously reading it. <laughs> and so maybe for those just a little bit more, so at least when you're reading it, it, it appears really natural. Um, I really also appreciate those who stood up. I actually liked that, that you presented yourself and, um, I especially liked some of you included that wisdom, that vision. And I think Bert um, commented on that too. I think as especially PhDs, your philosophy doctors, don't be afraid to put your vision out there, why this is important and, and just inspire. I think those, those inspire them. Uh, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, again, very important to say why your research is important. When I did my PhD, I don't think I was really good at that. Either. Like I, I wasn't good at actually telling people what I'm doing and why it is important. And I think most of the presenters were really good at saying that, but uh, 
it's it's probably a super most important part of your presentation. I really liked also those slides where you had a problem statement and a solution statement. I think in, in one slide, if I could just see that and, and if it comes really clear, what is your problem? What is your solution? Then it's an easy take home message. So I like that um, and just help the slide kind of um, guide my eye. OK, first I have to look at this and then I have to look at this. And then I have to look at this. So try to make your slide so it's like super easy for someone to catch. So those are my small feedbacks. Uh, I'm sure everybody has something different, but I really, really enjoyed my morning. It was it, it was fantastic. So thank you everyone for including me and congratulations to all the participants and all the winners. I'll go next if, I, if it's okay. Uh, so uh, I know that everybody said that, but I would like to thank the EGCC and organization committee as well because it was it was a hard job. So thank you so much. It went perfectly to me. Uh, in terms of the presentations, what I really liked that about this was about fifty percent of these talks were about carbon captures. So I really like that we are really caring about the environment and we are, you guys are already talked a lot about green energies and then trying to make the environment feasible for the living species for a longer time. Thank you so much. I was really uh, moved by this amount of research that is going on in our university, especially College of Engineering. Uh, the other thing, probably a couple of points, uh, you have three minutes. You had three minutes to talk about your uh, project and everything. Uh, I can say 50% of you guys didn't use that three minutes. You, you, some of you even barely touched two minutes. So tr when you have a three minutes, try to explain your problem and the solution in three minutes. You have, you have all the minutes. So uh, the fact that we finished the first session much earlier than we're supposed to do, it means that uh, many of the people who probably attended the first one didn't even use the three minutes in total. So that was one, one point. The other point that you had, some of you had the presentation ready with different parts, but during your talk, they did not even mention those parts. Some of you did. They said, okay, now in the right column of the, the right-hand side of the uh, presentation, you will see this. Top, you will see that. Some of you did even mark them A, B, C, D. In the A image, you see this. In the B image, you see that. But uh, again, uh, a few, maybe more than a few people did not even use their own presentation. It was just a picture for us, not for the topic that you were talking about, probably, I don't know. You are not, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to make is, uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that you did not even, some of you didn't uh, make a connection with your own presentation picture, uh, then, uh, then how did we, how we were going to do that? I don't know. But uh, other than that, I think everybody did a good job. Uh, the fact that we had 10 people above 80 points, it, was, it meant that uh, it went pretty good. And I really enjoyed my morning as well. And I was glad that I was here for the second, um, second year in a row. I hope we'll see this in future. Okay, I'll go uh, next. Uh... I want to congratulate everyone who participated in this competition. I think everybody did a good job and some of most of you are good storytellers. Some of you are exceptional storytellers and that's what I was looking for. Someone who can tell me what the problem is, what the solution is, how it is going to impact our society and our uh, you know, planet. And uh, you know, I think uh, winners uh, include winners and other majority of the people achieve that uh, target. So I think uh, I want to repeat what um, Mohsen said, you know, most of you uh, did not use up the three minute available. So, so the next time, please use up full time. And uh, that's the only uh, comment I have. All of you did a good job and thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to listen to your presentation and really enjoy uh, your presentations. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go next if that, that's okay. 
Um, hi everyone, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just like many uh, of the judges have spoken, uh, you've all done a tremendous good job, uh, especially this year. I've been uh, stuck at home like many of you and thinking the world is getting uh, um, more uh, confused than uh, uh, probably just me, but very interesting. Uh, but after uh, listening to your presentation, I feel the world is a better place. Uh, I know there are lots of people who have great passion, uh, using great technology, trying to seek the impact. Uh, I, I'm very pleased to hear that, and I, I think that you should all be proud of yourself. Uh, many things have been said. I think uh, one thing uh, noticed is don't leave time on the table because that's a great resources you have in in such presentations. Uh, practice to use it. Uh, but I also want to uh, mention that uh, two more points is uh, to start with the why, like the big picture, why the research is important uh, to really uh, emphasize on that. I know that some of you did really great on that. Uh, it really saw to the judges like we, we understand the importance and how that contributes to the greater of society and the business outcome to whatever organization potentially would use the uh, technology. Uh, some of you went a little bit too much on the solution side, uh, too technical. Uh, maybe um, let's start with why uh, to, to uh, focus on that. On the flip side, um, to, to communicate, don't be afraid to get to the quantified uh, value proposition. What I mean is once you tell us why you're doing the research, we know What's the big problem you're addressing? Can you quantify how much better you are with uh, compared to the current state? Just with the number, maybe we're 30% more efficient, 20% more safe. Uh, so uh, a simple number help the audience to know exactly what you did and to what extent you're better. Uh, some of you stayed to the qualitative uh, realm, it's great. Uh, but if you can go uh, one step further, I think it will make your communication a little bit more clear and more convincing as well. Uh, one last thing, uh, I noticed uh, a couple of uh, people went a little bit negative, like uh, in, in presentation. Um, th this is one thing uh, my pe next people don't go far in life. Uh, be positive. Uh, you, you are going out there to help people and you're doing the great work and uh, uh, be positive, uh, lead people instead of uh, uh, blaming them for not moving. So uh, that, that will also set you up as a great leader. All right, thank you judges. Um, all that feedback is huge. And I know when I went on to Westerns, I took all my judges feedback and it tremendously made a difference out there. So thank you judges for your time and your expertise and your experience and your encouragement just to all the presenters. I know that goes a long ways. Uh, one final thing, we have the door prize winners, I believe, Chubb. Um, and we are going to be having, sorry, things are changing on the fly. Um, by Hamid, you're going to be presenting the door prize winners, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Shanti. So I need to share my screen. So we will have three door prizes for our participants. But since we had already uh, four winners, uh, like first, second and third place and audience sources, I will omit those uh, those people from the list. So if I get a number, a random number for that person from the list, and that I, I need to pass that one and generate a new number. And also this number 12, it was, I think, Tasneem who had already withdrawn his uh, uh, his presentation. So these four people won't be in the list for my number generator. And I will I will do a number generation from the Google uh, random number generator. Uh, you should see not my screen right now. Is it fine? OK. So, so we, we have uh, from number 1 to 25, which was our participants, and I will generate one number to see who is the first one. Let's go. So number 13 is our first winner for door, door gift. It is Arash Mullah Hosseini. 
congratulations RS uh, for this gift from us. And uh, the second person will be number 22. Uh, he is Elnaz Etminan. Uh, congratulations to you, Elnaz. Uh, I will hand this uh, prize for you. And the third person will be number 23. And number 23 is Ahmad Karimi. Uh, congratulations to Ahmad. So we have three people for door gifts. Uh, I, I will, I, I, I'll ask uh, these three people to send me an email and I will find a safe, safe way to hand their gifts to them. And I hope that they, they like their uh, gifts. Yeah, that's it. Perfect, thank you so much, Ahmed. Well, from all of us here uh, running the Engineering 3 Minute Thesis Competition, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, the second round of it, and we look forward to having it be an annual event. Also, thank you for EAT for sponsoring the amazing um, prize money for the participants. I know that goes a long ways with encouraging people to number one, sign up, but then also it's a beautiful bonus uh, as we're kind of living stipend to stipend <laughs> as it goes. So thank you so much for that. And that concludes our presentation. Unless Shahab, you have anything else left to say? Yeah, I just want to thank you, thank you all. Yeah, the, uh, in the background, we had a team. So the outcome was just output from a team, not just a person or two person. So thank you all, all who kind of contributed to this event. And I just want to add, add something that we had really good support from our alumni. So, and it usually comes from our under our undergrad students. So I want to also uh, kind of encourage our grad students so that when they graduate from university, feel that kind of being a family of USASC and being committed to USASC and trying to support uh, the grad the future grad students when they, after their graduation, because uh, as you see, there are lots of things happening in the university and there are lots of ideas, uh, lots of uh, research going on, which will help all of us to have a better society and better world to live in. So thank you so much. And thank you all, all judges for their support. They, uh, they had really busy schedule, but they were, uh, this, as always, they were really supportive. I really, really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much and have a good one. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Shahab. Great job. I'll connect with you uh, a little bit later and I'll give you my comments. Thank you, Aunt Tammy. Thank you. All right. Yes, take sir. care. <laughs> I think I should wait for the online streaming to finish or I should stop here. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you, Shahab. Uh, good work. We'll see you sometime.